In this lecture, I want to talk about two phenomena that I find absolutely amazing and which make single particle cryo-EM structure determination possible. Now, as you know, in single particle cryo-EM, you start with a electron microscope image. It looks really quite terrible uh, with individual particles. The particles are your macromolecules of interest. And, uh, a large number of these images are fed into this black box called single particle reconstruction, and out comes a density map from which you can fit an atomic structure. And the point of this course is to look in some detail at what happens inside this black box. And the idea is, if you know what's happening inside the black box, then you know what kind of data are needed, how best to design an experiment, and also how best to evaluate the results. Now, in introducing this, I thought I'd also talk about the three people who recently won the Nobel Prize for cryo-EM and specifically cryo-EM single particle reconstruction. So Jacques Dubochet, one of those three, uh, discovered that it's possible to rapidly freeze biological specimens on an electron microscope grid and still preserve biological structures. So for example, these um, bacteriophage virus particles. And the idea is to freeze, uh, freeze your aqueous solution uh, surrounding your biological particles very rapidly in a very good cryogen, liquid ethane, and this rapid freezing rate prevents water from uh, forming ice crystals. And for me, the astonishing phenomenon in these frozen specimens is this, that a large macromolecule, for example, something the size of a ribosome, has from one copy to another the positions of individual atoms consistent within something on the order of one angstrom unit. And that means that we can obtain information from multiple copies of our macromolecule and average that information together to extract three-dimensional structure. So it's the reproducibility of atom positions that fundamentally allows us to gather information from multiple particles. Now, how do we get uh, three-dimensional structures from two-dimensional images in the first place? Well, uh, it all starts with an important theorem that we'll talk about later called the Fourier slice theorem. Any two-dimensional, three-dimensional uh, uh, density distribution has uh, an equivalent representation that's obtained by the Fourier transform. And the Fourier slice theorem says that if we construct a projection, say in, in, uh, in this case in the horizontal direction of our object, and in this case the object is in two dimensions and our projection is in one dimension, that projection corresponds to a slice of that two-dimensional Fourier transform. And so the idea is that if we, if we obtain projections in different directions, uh, we can fill in different slices in the Fourier transform with the angle of the slice corresponding to the angle at which the projection is taken. So if I fill in uh, some, of these, uh, some of these projection directions, I get, uh, I fill in, in this case, half of the Fourier transform. And of course, given the Fourier transform, I can now go back to real space, and this is now my reconstruction of this object. And you can see it's not perfect, but you can begin to recognize it. It has artifacts, and these artifacts are due to this missing wedge of information in these two missing wedges of information in the Fourier transform. The artifacts are such that if we look around, along a direction where we have information, like here we actually have uh, pretty good high resolution information, but along this, this other direction where the missing wedge is present, uh, things are smeared out. But if we now uh, finish uh, collecting an entire set of angles, we actually get quite a good reconstruction. Well, what did we do? We just filled in line by line um, 
slices of the Fourier transform, and then we compute the inverse transform and got a 2D reconstruction. We can do this in three dimensions as well. In that case, the projection is a two-dimensional two image. This is a uh, this is a two-dimensional Fourier transform, and what we are doing is we will be inserting slices into a 3D Fourier volume, and if we insert a complete set of slices, then we can get a three-dimensional reconstruction. Now, the problem with that process in the case of cryo-EM is we have here images that represent projections of three-dimensional objects, but the three-dimensional objects are oriented in randomly in the ice, and we don't know what those orientations are. And so this is a, a very fundamental problem in single particle reconstruction, which is how do we know the orientation so that we know at what angle to insert that slice into the 3D Fourier transform? You can see that it's a difficult problem because there's not a lot of information in, in one of these images. But this is what we think the image is. We start with a three-dimensional uh, three structure, and this is a three-dimensional density. Uh, we can model what the microscope does to this density here. This is what the microscope image is expected to look like, and then uh, as actually recorded with a lot of noise, as we'll see next time, this is what the image looks like. So the question is, can we somehow from this image determine what is the orientation of the underlying three-dimensional particle? So the basic idea is we take our particle image and we compare it to calculated projections of the three-dimensional object as we rotate the three-dimensional object through all possible orientations. And so here we very rapidly are comparing these two images. And what I'm plotting here is a probability of obtaining this image given, uh, given that reference as a function of two of the orientation angles. And you can see that there is a pretty clear maximum of this probability and uh, to finish the calculation, you can see that this maximum is, uh, is clear and it restricts the uncertainty of those angles to maybe one or two degrees. So even though this image looks so hopelessly blurry and noisy, it is possible there is just enough information in that image to be able to determine the orientation angles quite precisely given a good reference model. So we can quantitate this by asking, well, how big are the errors in angles uh, um, from, a, uh, from an ensemble of images from a particle all in, the same, uh, all in the same orientation, which we can do by simulation. This process of determining angles by doing this comparison between images is something pioneered by Joachim Frank, our second uh, Nobel Prize winner. And uh, you can see how precise this kind of uh, projection matching can be. So if we take our original uh, image with a given uh, signal to noise ratio, we can easily distinguish the correct from a nearby projection of the three-dimensional object represented by these two points. And uh, this uh, SNR of one, the, the experimental signal to noise ratio, gives a confidence uh, interval that's within a couple degrees. If the signal to noise ratio goes down, that is if somehow the imaging process is not quite as good and there's more noise, uh, there's more uncertainty in the determination of those angles. So, we can see then, in, schematically at least, how the single particle reconstruction procedure might, might work. We first take our micrographs and extract those little particle images from them, and we somehow obtain an initial three-dimensional model of our uh, particle's density. And then we compare each particle image with uh, references ima reference images, which are projections computed from the model. 
And uh, in the process of those comparisons, we assign probabilities to the projection directions uh, that we think the particle may have uh, based on uh, the information in the image. And then we use that orientation information to then insert slices into a three-dimensional Fourier uh, volume and uh, then do the inverse Fourier transform and make this reconstruction the new 3D model. And, uh, uh, and then we iterate. Now that we have a better three-dimensional model, we can go back through these steps. And uh, under certain conditions, we can be confident that this iterative process will improve the model and hopefully give us the correct structure. Now, this is computationally very expensive. The orientation determination requires that we take a reference, uh, um, we rotate it, and we com compare many thousands of possible different orientation uh, projections at many thousands of different orientations with our experimental image. And so you can see the total number of operations depends here with the fifth power of the size of the image that we're using. That is roughly the fifth power of the, of the uh, resolution that we're working with. And it's, uh, it's extremely computationally expensive. So if we take a, uh, some typical numbers for a high resolution, say, three angstrom reconstruction, um, to just naively carry out this process uh, would require something on the order of 20 CPU years. But uh, rely on uh, CryoSpark, other programs are very efficient in choosing orientations and um, uh, uh, integrating probabilities only in regions where the probabilities are significant. And so there's a considerable speed up and one of the most interesting further speed up is instead of using a conventional computer or CPU, you use a graphics processing unit to perform these computations because they're very easily parallelized and GPUs have thousands of very simple processors working in parallel. And so that gains us another couple orders of magnitude of speed. So the black box now becomes something like uh, this machine I have in my lab, which ha is an extreme gaming computer with four high-end uh, graphics processing units. And so the process of single particle reconstruction is kind of like this. We start with a large number of these very noisy single particle images extracted from micrographs, process them in, uh, in this computer by algorithms that we'll be describing in this course. And the output of this is a density map that can be used for obtaining an atomic structure. Now, I'm still just amazed that this works. And I like this quote from Arthur C. Clarke, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I have to say that this whole process still seems magical to me. <laughs>